Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our 2022 Influenza and Pneumococcal Disease News Conference. It is so great to be together, uh, to be here in person again, and to be joined by so many of you on the webcast. There's over 400 uh, listening in from across uh, the country at least, and maybe farther than that. I'm Patsy Stinchfield, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, and I'm the president of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, or NFID. NFID has been hosting this important news conference for 25 years, and each year, we look forward to this day as a kickoff to, uh, that serves as our critical reminder of flu vaccination and how flu disease is unpredictable, it's potentially deadly, and it needs to be taken seriously. And that annual vaccination is our best protection. So NFID is committed to convening partners to advocate with one strong voice for the prevention of vaccine preventable diseases, all of them, and that includes flu, pneumococcal disease, COVID-19, and others. To that end, I do want to point out that we've asked everyone here in this room, this beautiful room at, um, in DC at the National Press Club to wear masks, unless they're on the speaking panel. Everyone in this room today, out of an abundance of caution, is wearing masks, so thank you all for doing that. And for those of you on social media and listening in, please feel free to live tweet or whatever you like to do and join that conversation with hashtags fight flu, all one word, or hashtag uh, prevent pneumo, P-N-E-U-M-O, prevent pneumo, all one word. So thank you for getting that word out in social media. Before we begin with our panel discussion, I'd just like to provide a few brief remarks, starting with an overview of why vaccination is so critical. And I bring this to you with uh, experience in, as 44 years in the nursing profession, 34 of those in infectious disease in children's hospitals. So I've seen more bad things come from these diseases than I care to recall. But let's just start with this. Flu is not just a bad cold. In fact, the words just and flu should never be in the same sentence. Flu can cause mild to severe symptoms, life-threatening complications, including hospitalization and death, even in children and adults, those with or without uh, chronic conditions. So healthy individuals of any age can get severe influenza. The key message that you will hear today is the most important thing that each of you can do is to get your annual influenza vaccine. Get that flu vaccine. The rec recommendation is simple. We've tried to improve and simplify this, this recommendation over the years, and it's this. Anyone six months of age and older needs a flu vaccine. And it's particularly important for those most high risk for influenza complication. That includes young children, pregnant women, those who are immunodeficient, certain racial and ethnic groups, those with chronic conditions, and especially those who are older, 65 years or older. And this winter, I'm gonna be joining Team 65 Plus, so I'm excited to get my flu vaccine today. Even in cases when flu vaccination doesn't prevent infection completely, it can help prevent hospitalization and death. There's many studies that point to this and help reduce the risk of other serious complications like heart attack and stroke. So now for some new information. This year, NFID commissioned a nationally representative survey of over 1,000 U.S. adults to understand their knowledge and attitudes about influenza and pneumococcal disease and vaccines. And we're pleased today to share those results with you. Just a few high points are, we were alarmed to learn that only 49% of U.S. adults plan to get their flu vaccine this season. That is not good enough. And nearly one in five U.S. adults who are at high risk for severe influenza disease 
say they are not planning to get vaccinated. That's a dangerous risk to take. And on a positive note, a majority of U.S. adults, 69%, said they recognize that annual influenza vaccine is the best prevention, the best tool that we have against flu-related deaths and hospitalizations. So most people know what to do, we just need to do it. So among those who do not, do not plan to get vaccinated against flu, the top reasons that they cited were kind of usual. They, they don't think they work very well. And they're concerned about their potential side effects from the vaccine. Well, we wanna put their minds at ease. Flu vaccines work. For more than 50 years, hundreds of millions of people in the US have safely received their annual flu vaccine. Sure, vaccine effectiveness varies season to season by different age groups, but even if you do get the flu, the vaccines can prevent you from going to the emergency room, to the hospital, or even from dying. So this is true in children and adults, so why take the risk of going unvaccinated? With regard to pneumococcal disease, which can be a serious bacterial uh, complication of influenza, our surveys show that only 29% of those at risk have been advised to receive a pneumococcal vaccine. The good news is that among those who were advised to get uh, the vaccine, 74% did receive their pneumococcal vaccine. So this underscores a key point to you, my fellow clinicians, as health professionals, our recommendations matter. We need to strongly recommend pneumococcal and flu vaccination to our parents. Please get a flu vaccine this year and every year, not only to protect yourself, but also your loved ones, your community, and those most at risk. And remember, flu season is a great time to make sure that you're caught up on your pneumococcal vaccine, your COVID-19 vaccines, and really all of your vaccines. Take a good look at them. So now I'm thrilled to moderate a panel of esteemed experts today. We will be joined by Dr. Tamika Agusti, ACOG Fellow and Chair of the Women's and Infant Services at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, by Dr. William Schaffner, behind me here, NFID Medical Director, by Dr. Jeb Teichman, Pediatrician and Retired Healthcare Executive, and by Dr. Rochelle Walensky, coming to us um, from the CDC as the Director of Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Following the panel discussion, we'll be taking questions from members of the media. Media tuning in online may submit questions at any time via the box below the webcast video on your screen. All the questions will be held until the end of the panel discussion. So now I'm pleased to welcome our panelists and we'll quickly ask each of them to introduce themselves and share sort of a one minute key message. And Dr. Walensky, I'm gonna start with you and then we'll go to Dr. Schaffner, welcome. Thank you so much, Patsy, for having me here today to encourage everyone six months and older to get their flu vaccine this season. I'm really honored to join this esteemed panel for this annual event to kick off this season's flu vaccination campaign. I really think the main message we should all take away from today is while we will never exactly know what each flu season will, we will hold, we do know that every year the best way you can protect yourself and those around you is to get your annual flu vaccine. So I am here to strongly encourage everyone who has not already um, to, been vaccinated to find the time and go get vaccinated. Great, thank you. Dr. Schaffner. Thank you, Patsy, and uh, good to be with you, although virtually. Uh, I'm Dr. Bill Schaffner. I'm a professor of infectious diseases and preventive medicine at Vanderbilt, and as Patsy said, the medical director of the NFID. I mean, my thought is that influenza will be with us each year. People ask me, how severe will it be? Don't think about that. Just focus on the fact that flu will be with us. We were a little bit spoiled. We've had two mild influenza seasons. And I think with all the interest in COVID, people have rather forgotten about influenza. I've had to remind them, this is yet another serious winter respiratory virus. It can 
do bad damage to you. And the key to best prevention is, of course, vaccination. Thank you. Great. Wonderful as always. Thank you. Dr. Augusti. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, like Patsy said, I'm Dr. Tamika Augusti. I am a practicing OBGYN, a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians Gynecologists, and locally here in DC, chairwoman of Women and Infant Services at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. And my message today, of course, is to encourage everyone to get the flu vaccine, but particularly pregnant women. Um, there has been a lot in the uh, news about vaccination rates for different vaccines, especially in this pandemic with pregnant women, but we know that the flu vaccine is safe in pregnancy, and I encourage all of my pregnant patients and colleagues and friends and all of our loved ones that are pregnant to get the flu vaccine. Wonderful, thank you. And Dr. Teichman. Good morning, thank you, Patsy. Um, my name is Jeb Teichman. I'm a retired pediatrician and healthcare executive. And I must admit that I'm not surprised to hear that NFID survey of people who, um, who were going to decide to get flu vaccines showed only 49%. We in, we in managed care have been fighting that statistic for many years. Flu vaccine is safe, flu vaccine is effective and especially for pediatric patients and the vulnerable, we should all get our vaccine. Great, thank you. So now we want to just ask some of our panelists some questions. So Dr. Walensky, I'm gonna start with you. So based on what we now know about the 2021-22 flu season, how can we look ahead to best prepare for this upcoming 2022-22? three season right now. Thank you so much for that question, Patsy. While there's really no way to know what flu activity will look like season to season, as Dr. Schaffner noted, we do know that every year the first and most important step to protect yourself is a flu vaccination. And that is what we're all here to talk about today. Over the past two years, we've seen some worrisome drops in flu vaccination coverage, especially in some groups of people who are at the highest risk of developing serious flu illness. I'll share more on these drops in coverage and overall vaccination coverage last season. But first, you mentioned last season, and I wanna take a moment to share a little bit about flu activity from last season. The timing and severity of the past two flu seasons has been different than our typical flu seasons because um, before the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is likely due to the COVID mitigation measures and other changes in circulating respiratory viruses. Last year's flu season was relatively mild. However, there was more activity during the 2021-22 flu season than during the prior season. Flu activity last season began to increase in November and remained elevated until mid-June, making it the latest season on record. Preliminary estimates show that during the 2021-22 flu season, an estimated 9 million people got sick with the flu, 4 million people visited a healthcare provider for flu, 100,000 people were hospitalized, and 5,000 people died due to flu illness or flu-associated complications. We also know that flu vaccination helped reduce this burden of flu. And last season, people who were vaccinated were 35% less likely to get sick with flu than people who were not vaccinated. During the 21-22 flu season, 51% of the overall US population six months and older received a flu vaccine. This overall coverage is similar to that which we have seen in the previous two flu seasons and prior to the pandemic. However, we did see drops in coverage among certain important groups. Pregnant people and children who are at higher risk of serious flu complications experienced some of the greatest drops in flu vaccination coverage over the last two seasons. Vaccine coverage for children six months to 17 years last season was 58%, a nearly six percentage point decrease from the 2019 20 flu season and the lowest flu vaccination coverage we have seen in children in the last eight seasons. 
During this time, we also know many children miss checkups and recommended childhood vaccinations. We need to remind parents and caregivers that flu can be dangerous for children, especially children younger than five years old and children of any age with certain chronic conditions who are at higher risk of de developing serious flu-related complications. We also know that pregnant people saw the most dramatic drops in coverage this past season, with about 50% of pregnant women getting their flu vaccination, a five percentage point decrease from the previous flu season and nearly eight percentage point decrease from the 2019-20 season. Getting a flu vaccine during pregnancy is crucial to help protect pregnant people and their babies against flu. Pregnant people are at higher risk for serious flu-related complications due to changes in the immune system, heart, and lungs during pregnancy that may make them more prone to severe illness from flu, including illness resulting in hospitalization. A flu shot during pregnancy has been shown to reduce a pregnant person's risk of being hospitalized with the flu by an average of 40%. Also, when pregnant people get vaccinated, they pass antibodies to their developing baby, which can help protect their baby from flu in their first few months of life. People with certain chronic health conditions are also at higher risk of flu complications, yet vaccination in this group remains low. For adults 18 to 49 with at least one chronic health condition, vaccination coverage was only 43% similar to the previous season. Last flu season, 94% of people who were hospitalized for flu-related complications had at least one underlying health condition. So it really is imperative that we continue to improve vaccine uptake among this important group of people. If you have one even well-managed underlying health condition, you might be at higher risk of flu-related complications and flu is vaccine is the first and most important step you can take to protect yourself against the flu. So these drops in coverage are troubling and preliminary estimates also suggest that longstanding racial and ethnic disparities in vaccination coverage persist in the United States. Last season, disparities of up to 16 percentage points were seen in flu vaccination coverage between white adults and adults with certain racial and ethnic minority groups. CDC will release vaccination coverage data by race and ethnicity, as well as more information on how CDC is working to address barriers to vaccination on October 18th in a vital signs report in the MMWR. This is an area CDC is committed to making progress to address these eight racial and ethnic disparities in flu vaccination coverage. These types of disparities cannot and must not persist. So as we look towards the 22-23 flu season, even though we do not know what will happen exactly during the upcoming flu season, we do expect for vi flu viruses to spread this fall and winter. And we know that flu vaccination remains the best way to protect yourself and your loved ones against flu and its potentially serious complications. Importantly, this flu season, we have updated our recommendations for adults 65 and older to receive one of three preferentially recommended flu vaccines. These are higher dose adjuvanted vaccines, again, for those specifically 65 and older. This preferential recommendation was based on a review of the available studies, which suggested that in this age group, these vaccines are potentially more effective than standard dose unadjuvanted flu vaccines. So people 50, 65 and older should try to get one of these preferentially recommended vaccines. However, if none of these vaccines are available at the time of administ administration, people in this age group should get any age appropriate flu vaccine instead. People 65 and older typically have the highest flu vaccine uptake, and that didn't change this last season. During the 21-22 flu season, vaccination coverage was 74% among people 65 and older. However, despite high vaccination coverage and while flu season remains uh, may vary in severity, during most seasons, people 65 and older bear the greatest burden of severe flu disease, accounting for the majority of flu-related hospitalizations and deaths. 
because they are the largest vulnerable segment of our society, getting this age demographic vaccinated with effective vaccines is especially important. So now I'd like to discuss just for a minute the co-administration of flu and COVID vaccines, updated vaccines together. Like last flu season, flu vaccine and COVID-19 vaccine can be given at the same time if you're eligible, and most of you are, and the timing coincides. Studies of over 450,000 people conducted throughout the COVID-19 pandemic indicate that it's safe to get both a COVID-19 vaccine and a flu vaccine at the same time. A CDC study published this summer in JAMA found that people who got a flu and COVID-19 vaccine at the same time were only slightly more likely to experience mild side effects in the day following vaccination. These reported side effects are similar for both shots, soreness at the injection site, headache, and fatigue. COVID-19 has interfered with many of our routines, including our routine immunizations. However, we know that staying up to date on all recommended routine vaccinations remains critically important. If you have questions about which flu vaccine is right for you or getting your flu vaccine at the same time as another vaccine, please talk to your doctor, pharmacist, or healthcare provider. And while we don't know exactly what to expect during this upcoming flu season, we do know the best ways to protect prevent flu. CDC recommends a three-step approach to fighting flu. One, get vaccinated each year, ideally before flu activity begins in your community. We know flu vaccination reduces the burden of flu illness, hospitalization, and death, and that getting vaccinated could also help protect people around you, including those who are more vulnerable to severe flu illness, like babies and young children, older adults, and people with certain chronic health conditions. Two, take everyday preventive actions to stop the spread of flu and other respiratory illnesses. This includes staying home if you're sick, avoiding people who are sick, and always practicing good hygiene, such as washing your hands often and covering coughs and sneezes. And three, if you do become sick with flu, take flu antiviral drugs if your healthcare provider prescribes them. Taking antivirals early can help shorten your illness, make it less severe, and it may prevent more serious outcomes. And finally, I'm so thrilled to be able to see all of you there in person and able to get vaccinated today. I wish I could be there to join you in rolling up my sleeve, but I'm really looking forward to joining my staff in October at our employee vaccination event to get my own flu vaccine. I want to strongly encourage everyone to take advantage of this preventive tool, get vaccinated ideally by the end of October. I hope that you will join me in making an annual flu vaccine a very healthy habit for yourself and your entire family. Thank you and I'll now turn things back to Patsy. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Walensky. Wonderful data and good news on the new information about the high dose or adjuvanted uh, vaccines preferentially for those 65 and older. Really important. Dr. Schaffner, let's go to you now. As an Thank infectious, you, Patsy. Indeed. As an infectious disease expert, what should we all know and do to minimize the impacts of the upcoming flu season? Well, thank you very much, Patsy. I'm going to reinforce the messages that you, Dr. Augusti, and Dr. Walensky have just uh, have just mentioned. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, influenza is indeed unpredictable. As I like to say, flu is fickle. It's difficult to predict how serious this next uh, outbreak of influenza this season is going to be. But if you wanted a hint we could look at what happened in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, below the equator, they have their winter when we have our summer. So what sort of an influenza season did, for example, Australia have? Actually, they had the worst influenza season over the past five years. So if you wanted a hint of what might happen here and you wanted yet another reason to be vaccinated, there it is. So perhaps a moderately severe influenza season is on the way. We'll have to see, but prepare for the worst, right? While we hope for the best. It's important to get vaccinated, of course, uh, and the recommendations, as Patsy has said originally, is so very simple. If you're six months of age and older, 
you should be vaccinated. Now that's just about everyone in this country, but there are some populations that we focus special attention on because they're more apt to have the complications, particularly pneumonia of influenza. People age 65 and older, they also accumulate underlying illnesses, which yet further increase their risk of developing pneumonia as a complication of influenza, requiring hospitalization, and frankly, the risk of dying. That's very important. People under age 65 who have any underlying illness, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes is so very common. People who are immune compromised. Dr. Augusti and Dr. Walensky have already mentioned women who are pregnant during the influenza season. The vaccine is safe. What's not generally appreciated is that women who are pregnant, if they get influenza, begin to look as though they have rates of complications and hospitalizations that resemble people age 65 and older. So their rate of complications themselves is higher. But there's also a bonus. If you vaccinate the mom, some of her protection, those antibodies, will cross the placenta, get into that baby, so that when the baby is born during those first fragile six months of life, we can provide some passive protection to that baby before the baby itself is available for vaccination. So it's two. Uh, benefits for the single immunization. So very, very important. And then, of course, we always emphasize that there are people in who are parts of ethnic and racial minorities in the United States. We need to make a special effort to reach out to them, persuade them also uh, to be vaccinated. One of the most common comments that I receive is that, you know, Dr. Schaffner, we hear all this that the vaccine isn't always a perfect match to the circulating strains. Well, it often is, but even if it is not, it is not sufficiently appreciated that even in those less well-matched years, the vaccine continues to provide some protection against severe disease and the complications of influenza. This is true every time this is studied. You still get protection against hospitalization, intensive care unit admission, and dying. And as I like to say, what's wrong with that? It's also not appreciated that when you get infected with the influenza virus, it creates an inflammatory response in the body. That, of course, is part of how we fight off that influenza infection. And after we recover from acute influenza, some of that inflammatory response continues to smolder for a period of weeks afterward. And if you have underlying heart disease, some of that inflammatory response can involve the small blood vessels that go to the heart and nourish the heart, and some of the blood vessels that go to the brain. Because after you recover from influenza, there is an increased risk of heart attack and of stroke, underappreciated. Many physicians don't know this. We'll give them a minute here. Can by extension also provide some protection against heart attacks and strokes. As has been mentioned, you can get vaccinated against influenza and against COVID simultaneously. Roll up both your sleeves and get vaccinated against both. If you choose not to do that, please remember to get that second vaccine because a vaccine deferred is unfortunately often a vaccine not received. And then I would also mention that of the people who are at higher risk for whom the vaccine has been
influenza vaccine, will receive COVID vaccine, and will also receive pneumococcal vaccine. So to my fellow healthcare practitioners, please make your recommendation a strong one. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Schaffner. And while, you know, influenza disease alone is bad enough, but potentially having stroke or heart attack in that same year is, is unbelievable when it's, it's preventable. All right, so Dr. Augusti, now to you. So as an OBGYN, what can you share about the importance of flu vaccination for those at higher risk of flu-related complications, especially your patients, the pregnant woman? Absolutely, thank you very much, Patsy. So yes, like Dr. Walensky and Schaffner said, there are populations that are higher risk for flu complications like hospitalization, hospitalizations and death. Pregnant women, close to my heart, are part of that group. Let's not forget the others, right? Um, infants and children under the age of five, adults greater than 65, and we, you heard about those comorbidities or those other medical problems like lung disease, heart disease, obesity, um, and so, and again, um, importantly, some of those racial and cultural uh, populations, and particularly black and Hispanic populations have a higher risk of flu complications. And why is that? Well, it's, it's pretty much what we know that's out there around a lot of the health disparities. For black and Hispanic populations, they have a decreased vaccine um, utilization because of unconscious bias, access to healthcare, um, structural and uh, structural racism, uh, distrust of the medical profession, and vaccine hesitancy. So as healthcare professionals, we have to reach out, do more for those communities, go to them, meet them where they are, have that extra conversation. It's those extra conversations that I have with my pregnant patients. I explain to them why they're more at risk due to their, their smaller lung capacity, their pseudo-immunocompromised state in pregnancy, and why they are at risk uh, for more flu complications like hospitalizations and death. We talk about the safety of the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is an old vaccine. It's been around and it has been tested on pregnant women and we know for it to be safe. I believe Dr. Schaffner and Dr. Walensky mentioned the two for one deal. Um, and I talk about this all the time. Not only will the flu vaccine help to prevent um, uh, the uh, hospitalizations and death and, 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 and outcomes in my, in my patients, but also they pass the antibodies on to their newborns um, for up to six months afterwards. So that's very, very important. Um, Dr. Walensky did mention the trend that we're seeing about vac vac uh, flu vaccine uptake in pregnant women. It is disturbing. It's concerning. Um, in 2019 to 2020, that flu, va that flu season, 58% of pregnant women got vaccinated. Um, in 2021 to 22, flu vaccine, it was down to 50. This cannot be a trend that we, are, we want to see. So this is the time that we have to turn it around. I, to reiterate to our pregnant women that the vaccine is safe in pregnancy. Take the time, listen to your patients. What are their concerns? Talk about everything. I often level set and say, no question is silly. You don't know this, I'm the professional, ask me anything. And so that I, so I do and I take the time and I answer those questions. And so I think that again, the message today more than ever is that in pregnant women, the flu vaccine is absolutely safe. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommend um, vaccination with the flu vaccine for all pregnant women. Keep in mind, you can pregnant women can receive the flu vaccine in any trimester, postpartum, even while breastfeeding. And again, that's another message that we send, um, that we give to our pregnant women. So thank you very much, Patsy. Great, thank you so much. It's such an important message. I'll never forget the H1N1 outbreak. The first several deaths were in pregnant women. They had such severe disease. Yeah, yeah absolutely, in pregnant women. Um, you know, it is a very uh, special group. Um, we've seen the, some of the uh, things with COVID-19 vaccine. So we wanna get ahead and make sure that the flu vaccine is um, something that is accepted by pregnant women. I love the two for one. So being in pediatrics, some of the sickest children I have seen in my career had influenza. And most children who are hospitalized with influenza 
are unvaccinated. Um, and so uh, it really is something that's preventable. So thank you so much for all your work, with those pregnant women and those babes. So now Dr. Teichman, thank you so much for being here. We've heard this important data, but you are here because you have a very personal story to share. You sadly lost your son, your 29-year-old son, to complications of influenza in 2019. Can you take a moment and share your story and the advice that you have for families this flu season and every flu season? Thank you, Patsy. And thank, I first want to thank the NFID for inviting me here to share my story and allowing me to partner with them towards our shared goals. On November 2nd, 2019, just before midnight, we were 650 miles from home when I got the call that no parent wants to get. Brent's cousin was calling me to tell me he couldn't wake Brent up. I'm here today to put a face on influenza. That of my son Brent, who we lost to its complications. But before I do that, please indulge me while I share a few tidbits about my son. Brent was a wonderful son, brother, uncle, and friend. He had a passion for everything he did, and that included his chosen calling of the culinary arts, but also included University of Kentucky sports. I didn't dare call Brent after a, a basketball loss. <laughs> and in fact, one of his most prized possessions was a picture of him and Coach Cal. He took, that <laughs> he called me to tell me that he was at the football game at UK with Coach Cal and I didn't believe him, so he, so he texted me a picture. <laughs> Brent had no chronic health conditions that would have made him high risk for, for influenza. He was a healthy 29 year old. He first reached out to me three days before his passing to tell me that he'd been ill for three days with a fever, cough, sore throat, what the CDC would call classic influenza-like illness. It was too late to start antivirals, so I gave him advice on, on symptomatic treatment. And we texted the next day, and I was glad to hear that his fever was trending down and that he was feeling a little bit better. I heard from him again two days later. He said he was having trouble breathing and over the phone I could hear him hyperventilating. So I sent him to seek medical care. And four hours later, I got the call. Jake called, Jake his cousin and roommate, called 911 and was performing CPR on his best friend. I have I cannot imagine how traumatic that must have been for him. I called Jake back a few minutes later and asked him to hold up the phone while I listened to EMS working on my son, calling for round after round of, medi of medications. He was in arrest and they couldn't revive him. To this day, when I close my eyes at night, I still hear the beeping of those monitors. The official cause of death was multilobar pneumonia etiology undetermined. But after 30 plus years as a pediatrician and 20 of those years as an influenza sentinel site for the CDC, I know influenza when I see it. There's a hole in our hearts that will never heal. The loss of a child is devastating no matter what age. And the irony here is that as a pediatrician, I was a tireless advocate for all vaccinations. But you know, when they're a young adult and they think they're invincible, you can't grab them by the hand anymore and drag them to get their flu shot. When we reminded Brent about getting his vaccination a couple of weeks before his passing, he said he had it on his to-do list and he just never got around to it. In his obituary, we requested that in lieu of flowers or donations, people go get their flu shot and it went viral on the internet. Hashtag number four for Brent. We are uplifted by family and friends and my former patients posting pictures 
of them getting their flu shot on the internet. And maybe we feel like we have saved another family from falling to our fate. We want to join with the NFID so that Brent's legacy will be increasing acceptance of, vac of flu vaccine and all vaccinations. Because as we all know, it's not just the flu. It can take the life of a healthy young person. And it did. It took my sons. And for all those listening to my story who are vaccine hesitant, do it for those who love you so that you won't walk they won't walk the path that we and many other families in this country walk. Once again, thank you NFID for allowing me to be here and to share my story, and thank you all for listening. I want to give you a hug. <laughs> not a dry eye in this room. Thank you so much, Dr. Teichman, for your powerful story and your bravery and willingness to come and share today and our condolences to you and your family. Brent is a beautiful person and um, you are, are taking a tragedy and trying to help prevent it in other families. So that is a noble and honorable thing and we appreciate you so much. Oh, so it brings back to me uh, lots of families I talk to who are in intensive care with diseases like influenza, and they say, I didn't know. I didn't know that this disease could be this bad. I didn't know influenza could be so severe. So please do trust us. All right, now I'd like to open it up um, to the media for Q&A. This portion of the event is reserved for questions from the credentialed media only and questions about influenza and pneumococcal only. So thanks for sticking to that. Um, please indicate in the room here if you have a question and one of our staff will hand you a mic. Um, please identify yourself and the media outlet that you represent before you ask your question. For media participating by teleconference, the operator will come on the line momentarily and advise you how to submit your questions. And if any of you in the audience would like to schedule one-on-one -on -one interviews with any of us that have spoken today, one of our staff will be happy to assist for interviews. I also want to acknowledge we have Dr. Alicia Fry, the Chief of Epidemiology and Prevention Branch in the Influenza Division at CDC here in the room with us. Thank you, Dr. Fry, for joining us. And she is available to answer any CDC data type questions. So, all right, so questions. We've got some coming in here. Very good. All right, Ken, um, this is from CBS News for Dr. Walensky and Dr. Fry. Can you uh, speak on early data that we've seen on uptake of the flu shot and the COVID-19 boosters uh, this season? And um, maybe, maybe you could start with what are we seeing so far with influenza this season so far and then talk about the uptake on vaccines. So thank you for that question. Maybe I will just start and say our data are still really early and the data that um, come in are only from insurance claims. So we are still collecting those data. We have had over 4 million people, I, or over 3 million people, I believe, get their um, flu vaccine. And we just started putting the COVID, updated COVID vaccine data um, up on, on our website as well. We've had over 7 million people get their updated COVID vaccine. But again, these are very, very early data. Um, and so we are really looking forward to getting more of those data in and seeing those numbers rise and rise quickly. Dr. Fry, I don't know if you have anything to add. She says no. Okay, so what is the, the typical trend that we're seeing in shots over October and November, and how does that compare to where we are right now? 
So we generally, um, October is a really heavy month where we're going to see, the, um, a, I think, a lot of a vaccination, both for COVID-19, the updated COVID-19, as well as for um, influenza. So this is the, the heavy lifting month. This is why we're doing this at the beginning of this month, um, because we really do anticipate that this will be the month where most of those vaccinations happen. I do want to articulate that um, given that flu season started last year pretty early, early November, um, that we really do want to get those vaccines into arms if we can in October. However, if you didn't quite get to it, if it was on your to-do list and you didn't get there, you should still get vaccinated after um, October into November and December because as also noted, we've had longer flu seasons over the last year or two. And so we do wanna make sure that you get that protection. Um, it'll start a little bit later if you get your vaccine later, but it will continue through the um, full season. So um, now is where we expect people will start um, really moving forward and getting both your updated COVID-19 vaccine as well as their flu vaccine, and ideally before the end of October. Great. Thank you so much. So even January, February, as you said, it can go into June. So if you haven't gotten it by then, you still can get it. Dr. Walensky, how soon will we have a sense of how well matched this year's flu vaccination is uh, to this year's circulating strain? Dr. Schaffner mentioned the Southern Hemisphere, and I did look up that they had a good, good match with the, what was in the vaccine to what circulated. How will we know for here in the U.S.? Yeah, I think that it will take us some time, a couple of months for us to see the match here. But the thing that I really want to emphasize is something that Dr. Schaffner said, which is we don't need to see a good match necessarily. We always like to see a great match, but we don't need to see a perfect match in order to get protection from the flu vaccine. So what we do know from last year is there was a lot of media reports that was not a perfect match, but even those data demonstrated a 35% reduction in serious illness presented to the doctor with influenza, even in a season where the reported match was imperfect. So we will have updating and we will continue to update our data about how good that match is. It'll take us a couple of months into the season, but I do want to articulate that we shouldn't wait for those data to go ahead and roll up your sleeves and get that vaccine because it doesn't even need to be perfect to work. Absolutely. So Dr. Agassi, this one's for you. How do we really know the flu vaccines are really safe in pregnant women for both mom and the baby? Great question. We know that the flu vaccine is safe because the flu vaccine has been around for a very long time. This is not a novel or new vaccine, and it has been tested, and we have lots of data to show that it is safe for both mom and the baby. Um, we know that this type of vaccine produces antibodies in the baby, which again can provide protection for that newborn within the first six months of life. So the flu vaccine has been proven over and over again to be very safe in pregnancy. Great. Dr. Schaffner, I think this one will come to you. Is it really worth getting vaccinated against flu if you can still get sick with the disease? Well, Patsy, as you would say in Minnesota, you bet. You of betcha. course it's important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as Dr. Walensky was just saying, uh, even if there's not a perfect match, this vaccine continues to provide protection, substantial protection against serious disease. You know, that sounds familiar. That's what we say about COVID vaccine. Also, these are two respiratory viruses, vaccines against these respiratory viruses. And this is a harder concept for the average person to grasp. These vaccines tend to produce better protection against severe disease than milder disease. And that protection we get against severe disease is very, very important, particularly to those people who are at increased risk of those serious complications. Older persons, people with underlying illnesses, the immune compromise, as Dr. Augusti has just said, women who are pregnant. So it's very important to get the vaccine, indeed. Great, thank you so much. So um, Dr. Walensky, you talked about the ability to get flu and COVID-19 at the same time, which is good, but the question is, will co-administration cause worse side effects? Should people expect feeling worse? 
Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, we have looked at this intensively. We did a study that looked at over 450,000 people who got co-administered COVID-19 vaccine as well as the flu vaccine. And what we saw is maybe a mild uptick in those mild symptoms, the sore arm, fatigue, headache. Um, and most of those resolved really quite quickly. So from a convenience standpoint, I would say really important. Um, you wanna make sure you get both. It's often more convenient convenient to get them both at the same time. And the data that we're seeing is really no compromise in safety when you get them both at the same time. Maybe one other thing I will just note is that if you don't know where to get your flu vaccine and your COVID updated COVID vaccine, you can go to vaccines.gov and type in your zip code and it can point you to vaccines that are available to you if you're over 65, where you can get the higher dose vaccines um, and where you could potentially get them co-administered. So those resources are available to you. Grand. Okay, Dr. Schaffner, I think you get, you get the final word here. Um, can you speak a bit about this year's updated flu vaccine? You mentioned it for older adults. Specifically, what is the rationale behind the recommendation and what are the options? Well, we should know that every manufacturer is now producing a quadrivalent vaccine. That is, it provides protection against four different influenza strains. So we're trying to cover the waterfront two influenza A strains and two influenza B strains. And for those persons age 65 and older, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, the ACIP, has now preferentially recommended that one of the vaccines, there are three, And then there's the recombinant vaccine. Now, if we look back at people age 65 and older who received vaccines in the past, already 80% of those persons were receiving these vaccines. Now the ACIP has said, let's give this an additional push to make sure that this increased benefit is available to everyone age 65 and older. Great, so higher dose than usual, adjuvanted, which means an added uh, uh, part of the vaccine that makes your immune system recognize that flu antigen, take it up, build those antibodies better for the older individuals. So thank you. Thank you all so much for the questions. Thank you for joining us. And now please show your support for annual vaccination by joining the NFID Leading by Example initiative and share your flu vaccination photo on social media using the hashtag fight flu. And please be sure to tag NFID. So our panelists have each emphasized how important it is to get vaccinated, and I'm thrilled they're also committed to lead by example and model just how easy it is. I'd like to invite Dr. Melvin Gerald of VaxCare to join us on stage, and all of us will get our flu vaccine now. So woohoo! this is the fun part. <laughs> And I think I'm going to go first. And we all signed our consents and did all the legal stuff, so we're good. Thank you so much. I don't think we'll need it. Well, we will need it. 
Yeah. Does it have giraffes on it or anything? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Great. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Uh, who's going to be next? I will. Who will be next? So I will share my photo. Sure. I'll share my photo and I will put hashtag fight flu. I'll tag the NFID and we'll make that go. Can I have a couple of more alcohol swabs, please? And we have a whole flu clinic in the back that um, people in the room are able to, to join. So one of the things, I've given a, a gajillion flu shots in my life uh, to children and adults, and one of the important things that he is doing so well is that friction of the alcohol wipe sends a signal of pressure to your brain so you get less of a signal of pain when that needle goes in. And I do believe that that group of people who know they need vaccine and don't get it, I think a lot of them are scared of needles. So um, it's, a, it's a actually more common uh, phobia than you would realize. But that rubbing with the alcohol wipe, those of you who give shots, really helps send that, that signal to the brain. All done. All done. Good that job, yes. We need music. We need applause. And you'll notice Dr. Gerald is wearing gloves. It's not a requirement by CDC or OSHA, um, but out of an abundance of caution, people can choose to go above the minimum infection control standard. So he, is, he wears gloves as he vaccinates. This is for Brent. This is for Brent. All of these are for Brent. So thank you so much, Dr. Gerald, for being here from VaxCare today to join us. And thank you all for doing your part to protect yourselves, your loved ones, and your communities. And so in closing, I'd like to say, remember the three steps to take to fight flu. Number one, get vaccinated against, flu vac against influenza. Every year, everyone six months of age and older. Number two, practice those healthy habits. These masks helped us. I wore a mask on the plane from Minnesota. I will wear it back um, and wear masks as you need to, but also cover your coughs and sneezes. And please stay home from work and childcare and school when you're sick. And if you do, number three, if you do have symptoms, call a healthcare professional as soon as possible and take flu antivirals if prescribed. So we also encourage everyone to get up to date on all of their vaccines, including COVID-19, pneumococcal vaccines, and others you may be behind on. 
We just want to close by thanking some people. The news conference is sponsored by NFID in collaboration with CDC. So there have been big teams in this room and afar at CDC who worked very hard on making this day happen. So uh, warm thank you to all of you. A special thanks to our partners and the funders who make this activity possible, including AstraZeneca, GSK, Merck and Company, Sanofi, Pasteur, and Securus. But I will note that NFID policies prohibit funders from controlling program content. So we wrote this, not, not anybody else. Uh, a video of today's news conference and additional resources will be available on the NFID website, which is nfid.org slash 2022 flu news. So we'd now like to call on each of you to lead by example, by joining us um, in the flu vaccine for those of you in the room here. And thanks in advance for participating, those of you on the webcast and in person. And thank you to our friends at VaxCare for administering our vaccines this morning and providing this valuable service to everybody here. And for those who registered in advance, you can line up um, uh, on the on-site vaccine clinic in the back of the room once the panelists exit the stage here. For those who are interested but you didn't register in advance, we may have additional flu vaccines, but uh, you know, just like flying standby, kind of wait until they, they let you know if there's a seat available, so to speak. So thank you so much to all of our panelists, our many partners, and all of you journalists for what you do to help spread the word about these important public health issues, the good word, the facts, the science. Thank you so much. Stay safe, be well, and fight flu.